All right, thank you. Um, so yeah, Danish names are hard. My name is Per Plo. We ignore us all. We, all, we generally ignore G's and J's and D's when we pronounce things, and we don't spell things as they're pronounced. It's very hard. So but you did a really good job. Thank you. So anyways, um, so ever since the beginning of Spotify, we used open source, and because of the the culture, engineering culture inside of Spotify, which is very autonomous and people are driven by purpose and so on, like our engineers just naturally decided to also start releasing open source, and there was no like. There was no awareness campaign. There was no like OSPO driving all these things. It's just engineers doing what they like doing and trusted to do so because they felt that it was the right thing to do because they were passionate about it. Um, and we've been doing that for 10 years. Uh, but still, after uh, 10 years, we also we started looking at what we were actually doing. Um, and we could see that we actually struggled with prioritizing our projects long term. We had a tendency of leaving them unmaintained. We had a hard time like rationalizing why we even did some of these things when we ask engineers, why did we open source this? And they was like, it's cool. And that's, um, that's it. Um, and when we look at all the other work we do at Spotify, we have a clear justification why we do it. If we don't have a clear justification, we test it, we try it out, and then we see if it works or if it doesn't. If it works, we do more. If it doesn't, we stop doing it. But that didn't really apply to open source at all. So we kind of had a, uh, you can say, a discrepancy. We treated open source as something magical, as something special. Um, and also this thing driven by passion. Everyone respected the passion of the engineer who just wanted to do something. Um, but then at the same time, we simply hadn't realized that open source is actually just work. Um, especially in the context of a company where you do open source on their behalf, it is just work and it should be treated as such. You should set goals, you should dedicate resources and you should also have a sense of what you're doing. Does it make sense or not? Because for the company, and also well, it is your employer, it is also your team and your, your colleagues, it is actually just technically um, a business. So that was, a, that was a challenge for Spotify, but it's also, I think it's also generally a challenge, a structurally problem in the ecosystem, which also leads down to being a problem that impacts sustainability and diversity as a whole. So with that like long winding intro, I'll share what we are doing internally and how that kind of reflects on why we see the bigger ecosystem and where we're going from that. Um, so just three metrics on how we realized what we were doing wrong and then three beliefs that's guiding us and the three specific things we're doing. And then uh, I've done this before. So the new thing is we have now started measuring the impact of doing this. So I'll share some metrics and some, some insights on that as well. So let's talk about metrics. Um, when we look at our commit history for our open source projects, we could see that a lot of our commits actually happened outside of working hours and on weekends. Um, this is also like on par with the industry. We know that over half of all open source hap uh, work happens outside of working hours. It is a problem if um, you want to have like a sustainable workforce that you don't depend on them to work in evenings and weekends. It's also a very specific kind of person who can dedicate evenings and weekends. People without families or sick relatives or household duties and so on. Um, this also leads to maintain a burnout, that you feel you have to do your additional job on top of your normal job uh, for a project that's owned by your employer. So we actually don't want that. We, we want to have employees who do the thing that makes sense in their working hours. Um, also, when we look at our dependencies, we have, um, we have more than 2,500 dependencies. That's like the direct ones. We have around 30,000 in total. I think for reference, I think Google has like 10,000. So we have an enormous amount of stuff we just added into our landscape. Um, but when we start asking like which ones are important, and as Joseph talked about yesterday, it's like how do you know what is important? And people generally don't know because they don't even know why they were added. So we didn't have a strategy for our upstream contributions. We had very limited involvement in, in key technology we actually depend on, and we didn't do any financial, non-financial support. We do it on an individual access basis, so saying an engineer fixes something, patches something, and so on, but it's not like we have a strategy of being involved in a key technology because it makes sense. Then when we look at our uh, quality of our own projects, um, looking at the 125 projects we deemed as somewhat active, uh, 116 of these did not really live up to the, our own like, quality baseline we would like to see. That's what we see on our own internal projects, is that we shouldn't have open security vulnerabilities, we shouldn't have stale pull requests, we shouldn't have stale issues. And we should probably also have some sort of commit in the last 12 months, which is kind of, the, if you don't update a code in a year, there's something wrong. And that leads to the bigger picture of saying we have a number of repositories 
Um, that's the blue line, it just keeps going up. We release more and more things. And then you look at the red line, that is the activity on the same projects. That means we are just like going up and up and up in the amount of code we have to maintain, but we're not putting more effort in. So that means that we're just moving on from thing to thing. Um, and, oh, that's the next shiny thing. We're just gonna leave the old stuff behind. A new thing, a new thing, a new thing. Um, at some point, we had three different projects that basically did the same thing, but it's just like an iteration of the old project. So instead of like, you know, upgrading the old thing, we just like migrated to the next one. Which is totally fine, I get that. It's like, sometimes there's reasons for this, but you also need to stop and think, why are we doing this? So, um, this impacts, this has a negative impact on the computer, uh, contributor experience. Because again, if you try to contribute something, you just like throw your pull request into the void and nothing happens, that's a bad experience. It also reflects poorly on the perception of our like, ability to engineer anything. It's of course like a supply chain risk for everyone who's trying to use our code. Um, but I think actually most importantly, we couldn't tell the difference between success and failure. Like if we put a project in there and we just move on, this product could actually make a bit of success if we kept investing in it. Um, it might also be a terrible idea, but we keep throwing engineering hours into it because we don't look at actually what happens. So, um, so let's talk about the beliefs that, that try to guide this going forward. So first of all, we believe that creators should be paid for their work. That goes for musicians, that also goes for open source maintainers. And if we look at maintainers as a whole, like half of them don't feel ad adequately compensated, like half of them feel stressed. So I think that number has probably gone up. And we also see that there's an increasing amount of demands on and maintainers. We see the, the push for open SSF, supply chain security, and we have a bunch of especially security vendors who are like pushing a lot of tooling that can just like give maintainers even more requirements. Like now you have to fill in an S-bomb, now you have to do a risk assessment. It's all gonna end on the maintainers no matter what they're saying. And there's no money following with these uh, increasing demands. Um, for us, depending on an abandoned dependency is an enormous risk. Um, and actually giving these projects money to stay alive is much cheaper than migrating to something else. It's a, it's a very cheap risk uh, reduction mechanism, actually, when you think about it. So also, we believe that all our employees um, should be given support and work time uh, to do meaningful open source on our behalf. Of course, the trick here is meaningful, and that's really the conversation you need to have. It's like, what is actually meaningful? Um, the reason why we believe in this is, if we look at the general ecosystem again, around 10% of all contributions in open source is from women, we again see this like 50, 60% of contributions happens outside of working hours. And it's a really desired skill to put on your resume. So um, we are targeting a very select piece of the population to participate in this thing that is a great advantage to have on your CV to progress your career. And that's why we're also keeping to see a, a continued um, like a lack of diversity in this field as well. So we need to change the basics and the structures of the system. So you don't need to be a dude who likes to do JavaScript in the weekend. And I'm, I'm one of those people. I like to do that, but it's not everyone who likes to do that. And that shouldn't be like a gatekeeping mechanism to do open source because it is important for career in tech. Um, so, and the last thing, uh, the last belief we have is we believe that the open source ecosystem is better off as a whole when we have more independent commercialization. There should be no stigma in making money in open source. And we keep talking about these open source unicorns. We celebrate that Red Hat was bought by IBM as what if, if that was like a tremendous leap for, for open source. But we don't really talk about open source small businesses, open source bootstrap companies. We're already always celebrating these companies who got like billions in, in VC money and are then pushed to make even more money so they can be sold to a bigger tech company. Maybe that's not the healthiest way to think about a business. Maybe we should think about if a maintainer can make enough money to support his project and his life and maybe hire another person. They have a pretty good two-person company going on there. It doesn't need to be billions. Maybe we should start in actually creating that like small ecosystem of vendors who can participate here instead of having like passion, 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 venture capital billions. It's a weird, it's a bit imbalance in the system. So, um, and we don't believe in this like thing of the right thing to do because this argument goes away when we hit financial times like this. This is when we see all these like the right things to do kind of projects go away. So we try to more balance our, our principles in the sense that this also makes time uh, sense in the financial um, like downtimes. So, things we're doing now. 
Um, internally, we're pushing very much on uh, establishing open source on equal terms to anything else. This is what I talked about in the beginning. Open source is not this magic activity um, that you can't put a value on, you can't measure. Uh, you should be able to measure it. Um, internally, we have these five operating principles that we guide all our different work. And we should use this guidance for open source projects as well. So we are essentially elevating our work to be prioritized on equal terms to core business work. That means if a team wants to invest in their open source project, this should have the same level of argumentation as it is to invest in something that goes into the Spotify application. Of course, that means that they will do less open source. It also means that they have to justify why they do it. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. That just means that we actually start applying some value in why we actually do this. And it actually makes the organization realize, oh, if we invest in Backstage as an open source project. That means that we can continue improving Backstage, we can establish Backstage as a standard in the space. That means that we don't need to migrate to another standard in the future. So there is, there is always rationalization to do open source. It's just not as straightforward. And because it's not so straightforward, we have always like gone into this thing of just saying it's open source, so it's like passion magic, so on. Um, so we want to go away from that. Of course, this means that the team needs to be committed and they need to establish these open source goals in their normal KRs as they do for everything else. It's just a process. Um, and again, that goes back to how we, we release and contribute. So we have a, we have a, you say a stricter release process now. Uh, one key element in there is to say, this is not an individually owned project. This is a team owned project. Your team own this thing you are, you are releasing. That means you need to align with your leads and your team has to agree this is a good idea. This is not your like hack week thing you're releasing. It is your team's ownership. Um, and that's also had an impact on like the amount of projects we've released actually by just putting that uh, restriction in there. So also we established ownership. So inside of Spotify, we naturally use backstage and this is meta meta because this is backstage monitoring the open source project max backstage. Um, the number of, of metrics we have at the top, that's the things we care about. So that's of course level of activity, but it's also percentage of work that happens within working hours on employees. So for our backstage it's 74%. Um, and there we can see the different things and so on. We, we do this to create visibility and backstage uh, for context also where we keep all our internal applications, our data sources and so on. So it is treated the same thing and we have, we have metrics to guide decision making here. So um, we need team uh, ownership and prioritization. Otherwise we can't really deliver anything long term. Um, and with this ownership comes the same responsibility to measure and learn and adapt as we have with anything else. And so we prioritize work that has a positive impact on our business and the team, and then eventually the individual through like career development. That's kind of the level of prioritization. And learn and adapt. That means also realizing after a year that nothing happened in your project. It's okay to shut it down, but it's just also just important to have that conversation. So let's talk about what happened so far. And this is the new part. Um, we managed to find owners for 50% of our repos. It's, it's hard to go to an organization figuring out like, where does this code come from and no one knows. Uh, but actually finding a team, assigning a team, and teams have now started using it and saying, hey, you are the team who owns this thing. We need you to patch this thing. So that actually works. We also published 90% fewer projects. And that is be especially because of this thing. Your team needs to agree this is a good idea. It's not, you just don't go YOLOing and, and do this yourself. Um, we reduced um, the amount of work um, outside work hours to 36%. Uh, we still would like to have it lower. And we also archived 100 projects, but we still managed to merge 12% more pull requests. So activity gone up, even though we have fewer projects to maintain. This is it's good. Um, so also internally, we asked our uh, engineers who have access to our GitHub repositories um, how they use open source contributions in their career development. And um, out of like 300 people, about 100 responded, about half contributes to open source here. And this is, again, this is the people who have access to, to GitHub, Spotify org. So that's, again, that's a fairly low number. And then only half of these people use it in the career development. So that's a fairly low um, awareness inside the organization on like, how do you actually leverage open source contributions? 
Um, so we still we still need to further push this into uh, standardizing these practices so that open source is in the career framework, it's in guidance for leads, it's in these development conversations. When you have a conversation with a junior engineer, it's like maybe you should learn this technology to like participate in this open source project. Maybe you should dedicate 10, 20 hours for this uh, a, a week. So that is how you level up. Um, but we still need this guidance. We still need to like normalize or institutionalize that, that process. So the other thing we're doing is funding dependencies. We did a FUS fund last year. Um, and we're very much targeting this like long end of the tail. We think a lot of people are very concerned with the other parts, and that's not really fast. We think there's plenty of, of, um, of um, a focus on Kubernetes and these other big projects, so that's not for us. Um, we are more focused on finding the long tail that's uh, maintained by individuals um, and also have a big impact still. And then we are also focusing on giving them a fairly large amount of money instead of spreading them out to like multiple projects. The large amount is mostly because we know that maintainers like to know that they have a pretty long like financial lifeline ahead of time instead of getting 100 euros here and there, we rather give them 10, 15,000 euros. Uh, so they know that they have money for setting aside a specific part of time. For our own use is also to see if we could actually, um, you can say, accelerate the impact of what we're doing here. So if we give a small project a big amount of money, maybe we can actually see like a bigger substantial impact so we can actually measure it. Um, so um, we, have, we funded eight, ten, I think we ended up funding nine projects. Um, we got nominations from employees to kind of see the things we couldn't see in our dependency graph. Of course, we also used the graph itself. Just a second. Um, and also importantly, we do this as a yearly announcement. So we don't want to like drip it over the year. We only want to do it once a year. Um, and still, teams have their own budgets as well. So they can also fund a thing if they really, really need it now. That's, that's, a, that's a totally separate thing. They can do that as well. The projects we ended up with were these. I think the most known one here is URLlib, um, which is a big thing in the Python um, ecosystem. Um, but the others are like fairly unknown, not, not like an um, enormous thing. But it's a whole thing we depend on. And I think with this and also what Joseph talked about yesterday, these are good projects. These are important. We know they're important. We can see these things like, um, uh, what's the thing now? I can't even remember the name. Sorry, but there's one, one project in here like, is referenced like 6,000 times in our graph. So that is important and it's main, oh yeah, ByteBuddy, sorry. ByteBuddy is referenced 6,000 times in our graph and it's maintained by one dude in Oslo. Uh, <laughs> so it's just like, okay, uh, we should probably get him, so give him some money. So that's like a very easy choice to make, but um, we don't know if it's the best projects. Um, there's probably projects that might have an even bigger impact and that's like extremely hard to actually compare. We know what is good, but we don't know if it's the best. Um, so we'll try to continue like balancing this over time and as we learn and start looking at, at the money and so on. So um, actually just establishing the understanding of this is critical. Um, and then our next step was give maintainers money and start measuring the impact. And then the, second, the third thing we also wanted was actually just to start acknowledging the culture of actually just paying for open source. So teams didn't have a problem going to procurement and say we actually just want to pay for this project but we don't get anything for it. And, and that's where like lawyer and procurement zone will always say, what, that's, that doesn't make sense. Um, but we have now, as we went through this funding process, procurement, legal, risk and so on, I was now fully aware that this is a thing you can do and it makes sense. So we unblocked that way. So looking at, at the impact of doing this, um, we compared H1 and H2. We transferred the money exactly in the middle of the year, so that was very convenient. So we looked six months before and six months after. Is this scientific? No, it's not. This is what was possible, basically. So we'll, we'll keep looking at this. We look at the performance metrics and project announcements, and these are the same metrics we look at for our own internal projects. So this is our understanding of what could be a good indicator of what's good is. Um, of course, our risk team thought we would find something like this, uh, but we didn't. Um, people actually had like a really good use for their money. Some haven't really announced what they used it for. Some have kind of been like conservative of what they actually use it for. Uh, but when we look at the metrics we collect from these projects, um, and we are by no means taking any credit for this. This is the projects doing it, and I don't think our money has that big of an influence on it. But we see positive 
changes in all the different projects, except for two, is that the number of, of, uh, of different authors has gone down, which might be a good thing, as I, the same people do the same work. Instead of expanding authors, we just use the same people again and again. And also, uh, the last one is more negative one, is that we didn't have any employees who actually felt the need to actually start contributing to these projects, even though they were like publicized inside of the company. Um, so we can see that the, um, the breaking point is this hard to see line in the middle. That's where the money was transferred. And that's where we kind of see the changes between the two. So time to merge went down 20%. Commits went up 15%. Again, we're not taking credit for this. This can also just be a coincidence. We are just, this is just the numbers. Um, looking specifically at ULLIP, again, because it's a bit big project, but also because they're very transparent about what they do. Seth, one of the main maintainers, is very uh, transparent, so if you should follow his blog if you don't already, because he, he provides like a lot of insights from the maintainer side on this thing as well. Um, they used uh, most of the money on actually establishing a bug bounty, uh, but also dedicating time for Seth and Quinton, one of the other maintainers, to actually take off time from work to work on this. They had a new big release, so they used some of this money to just not work and just do this instead. Um, and I think for their like, funds, I think they received 25,000 last year in funding, and we provided like half of that. So that's where we see like our money is going for this. We can look at that this significantly helped get to the 2.0 milestone for ULLIP. We can also see they opened up 14 buck bounties with this money, and they got people to, to contribute to these and, and close these pull requests. Also, pull request time went down as well. Um, and also, they managed to increase the number of repeat contributors uh, to these efforts as well. Um, so that looks like this. So you can see the first half of the year is the gray area. Whereas the, the blue area is, is the second half of the year. So you can see you have an expansion of work here among the same people. You can see people who contributed uh, 10 times went up to some, even went up to 15, 20 times instead. So you see you're expanding the amount of work done with these people to these, for instance, bug bounties. It's a good way of getting repeat contributors in there. Again, this is just numbers. We don't have the full impact here. Um, but it's good to see that projects we support are increasing on the metrics we care about. It's a good argumentation for us to, to continue funding. Um, and so, for projects out there, please do this. Like, please explain what you use the money for. Explain how, you, how this is a positive impact on your, your project, because OSPOs would really love to get that information so you can continue doing this. So the last part we're doing is commercialization. Um, that's the last belief in there. And the primary thing we're doing there is backstage. Um, it's an open source project we um, donated to CNTF. Um, it looks like this. It's an internal um, developer platform intranet for engineers where all your data and your services are located. Um, <coughs> these metrics are now a bit old, of course, but um, there's 1,500 uh, contributors. We have about 500 adopters now. Um, and we've had like 13,000, 15,000 ish uh, contributions now. Um, we like open sourcing this because it's a good reflection of our engineering culture. This is like the tooling that makes the, the Spotify model or the Spotify uh, culture work inside. Um, that we have a system in place that ensures that it's easy to do the right thing and really, really hard to kind of do the wrong thing. Um, and we also have about like 40 people working full time on backstage. And um, these people need salaries. Um, and we want to make that sustainable. <laughs> And we want to be engaged in this in, in, in long term. So it's not just about us funding this project to getting royalties from, from, uh, from musicians. That's not how it works. We want to have this be funded by the value we provide to the market. So we want to provide commercial add-ons on top of Backstage so that we can continue justifying having 40, 60 people on this. And a lot of that work actually goes into the open source core so that it benefits the ecosystem as a whole. But of course, some people have to pay for that. And that's true. Um, creating a freemium model where we have this commercial bundle on top of the open source core. Um, we will also enable revenue for third parties to like an ecosystem so that people can start using this uh, backstage as a distribution model for their plugins and own systems. Um, and that's all we have to make it self-sustainable. And I think importantly again here is that this is not to like 10x the investments, it's not to make billions, but it is to make it self-sustainable so we don't have to justify why we are pouring like 40 engineers into this every month. Um, impact here is hard to measure, right? Because we just launched the, the commercial plugins in December. Um, first revenue is booked, so we have customers buying this thing. Um, and we also build up an organization for long term. So we have 
sales organization, we have support people, we have product people, and that's driving both commercial and open source, uh, and they all work in one organization now. Of course, the community is still contributing to the core, so we're not trying to push anything out of the market here. Um, so yeah, and that's the three things. That's what we believe is like giving us like a more sustainable ownership of both what we own and what we drive and also what we depend on to work time and funding and commercialization. Um, again, by ensuring that we can dedicate work hours, we can pay maintainers, and that we also start pushing the ecosystem towards like a sustainable business model that doesn't depend on VC capital or having a search engine. Um, and this is all like normal considerations for any other kind of business that you do these things and it should also be normal for, for open source so that we can consider open source work as, as just work, which is what you get paid for and it's um, what you have time to do so you don't get stressed and get burnout. And it's work that can turn into um, careers and businesses. And for like a company like Spotify, we feel that it's important that we, we participate in making this change and that's why we have these beliefs. So. That was all for me. I think we still have like four minutes, right, for questions. Yeah. Yeah, so thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks a lot, Pierre. And uh, maybe one uh, question from the online community. Have you encountered projects with which didn't want to get money? Um, yes. Yes, we did. Um, we also had, yeah, projects that simply didn't want to bother with the whole funding because it is complicated to receive money. Like you need some sort of infrastructure. And I think there's, uh, there's projects like Open Collective and Get Responses that makes it easier, but some people just don't want to like, bother with it. So, yeah. Okay. Any questions here? Um, thanks for the talk, it was very good. Um, my question is, uh, how did you uh, manage the bounties? Uh, this is more of a technical question. W what bounty platform do you suggest? Um, did you do it yourself? Is there something out there? Um, so um, the bounties mentioned here was for URL lib, uh, and we didn't manage those. That's, that's totally what they manage themselves. Um, what I do see they do is they manage them to GitHub issues. Um, so that's where they set the price on the bounty, and when it's fulfilled, they just pay the money out to, I don't know actually, I think Open Collective. Okay, cool, thanks. Thanks for the talk. Uh, for the commercial, commercialization bet, have you thought about uh, like doing a spin-off uh, as opposed to in-house kind of commercialization? It has, it has been a consideration, but we also have a internal dependency on, uh, on Backstage, so we do want to keep things like fairly close um, so that we can kind of uh, take part of the investment as actually benefiting our internal systems, saying we, we keep investing in Backstage for our own behalf here. And that means that we don't need to find as much money to kind of fund it going forward. So again, we don't need VC and so on. When you spin it off into a different company, then you start having this like, oh, you need investors and you need to 10x this thing and so on. We, we would rather like go at a reasonable pace and be sustainable and kind of be self-funded in that way. So we... We know it's probably going to be a thing in the, in the future that that might make sense, but right now it makes more sense to, to keep it internally. Okay. Yes. Thanks for your talk, first of all. And uh, I'd like to know more about how do you extract the metrics? What are the tools that... Oh, sorry, I didn't... I didn't metrics. Analytics. Yeah. Um, so we we use Backstage for the presentation of this. We have uh, we have a fairly basic project that just basically collects all the GitHub metrics and put it in a Postgres database and then we curate and display it. So it's kind of a it's kind of a homegrown setup in that way. The the GitHub to database thing is an open source project, um, but the the display of it is just an internal Backstage panel right now. We we haven't had the time or a good rationale for open sourcing it. Um, <laughs> It would end up being like my own project, which again I don't want to do because then I'm doing all the things that say people shouldn't do. <laughs> okay, oh, thanks for the talk again. Um, you mentioned the, the the work that's been done on the sort of Spotify open source um, project. What about and the work that do you do on maybe just the other external open source projects? Do they still get the same sort of level of of priority? Is the open source work work for, for example, like you mentioned, Postgres, if you contribute to that. Yes, yeah, so um, it follows the same same means of justification in the sense that 
Of course, if you want to contribute to a random project, you can do that in your free time. If if you're contributing to something in your work hours, you need to justify that with your lead. And it's just it's a conversation like anything else that you tell your lead saying, "Hey, we we depend on this thing, and I think we need to fix this, or we need to stabilize this," and you're you're granted work hours to do so. Um, and that part has been a big part of like Spotify culture for a long time. So that is more ingrained in the culture already. Uh, we have contributed to, to projects we've depended on for a long time. And, and that is a fairly normal engineering process inside of Spotify. So we didn't want to like mess with that because that, that part uh, works actually quite well. Thanks a lot. So I think we at the end of our time. Thanks a lot again. Hi. Thank you.